in, in Bear Creek. We're spawning about first, second week of October. They'll hang out here and they'll start emerging in coming out of the gravel. They'll come out of the gravel in say February, um, March, ideally. Um, so when I say three months, it's actually a little bit longer. They'll hang out in the gravel, depending on, uh, you know, how cold the water is. And so like, if the water is warmer, they are, they are uh, ectotherms, what the heck? They're cold blooded, cold blooded uh, critters. So essentially like a snake or a lizard, little blue belly lizard, whatever, whatever the temperature of their environment is around them, that kind of speeds their development and their metabolism, how fast they, they grow. So, you know, the colder the water, the longer you're going to hang out down in the in the gravel and that's actually a good thing so think about if you're a baby fish and you're coming out in like january what's happening in january in the winter in oregon cold. it's cold we might have some really big rainstorms right so it's kind of not a great time what, what when do you usually see you know baby deer in springtime mm -hmm. yeah so it's kind of nature's way of Springtime is usually the environmental extremes are starting to kind of mellow out. And that's also usually early spring is when our baby fish start coming out. Um, they'll start coming out of the gravel. And then when they're coming out as little, as little fry, these little guys, you know, they've been hanging out for a few months in the gravel. All their food has been on their bellies. This is yolk sac. Eventually they pop out of their egg and their little alvin. Alvin, Alvin, a lot of people call it different. Alvin and the chipmunks. But these little guys, they have all their food and everything they need on their little belly. And eventually they're going to use it up and they pop out as baby fry. And that's when they're suddenly like, oh man, I'm out of the gravel. I got to start fending for myself. I need to start eating on my own. I need to start finding places in the creek that I can not get eaten myself. And so they'll, you know, They'll pick spots where there's downed wood and trees and leaves that they can hide under. And they'll hang out there and pick up little tiny, little tiny uh, bugs and stuff that are flying through the water and eat them. So believe it or not, guys, we actually have baby steelhead hanging out in Bear Creek right now in your own backyard. This is our, our by far our most impacted and urbanized stream in the in the rogue watershed, but we still have juvenile steelhead hanging out and juvenile Chinook salmon in Bear Creek. Um, and I can definitely guarantee you of that. Um, but for when maybe Chinook. Spawn, those, those two groups, they, the Chinook spawned in the winter? Chinook spawned in the fall. In the fall, yeah. Yep, we have but a spring run and a fall them. run. Yeah. And then we'll have coho spawning right after them, usually around December. Um, in some drought years, we've even seen coho spawning into early February. They'll actually hold off and wait till the, the conditions are right that they can get up in there. Um, and then uh, typically our, our, our uh, summer steelhead, we have a summer steelhead and a winter steelhead. Um, summer steelhead, kind of like spring chinook, they come in to fresh water, not mature and ready um, to spawn. Whereas our fall Chinook and our winter steelhead come in and they're actually ready to go. So they don't have to sit out and hang out in deep holes uh, to get ready to spawn. So the, the, the summer- spring wait for the fall, yep. they just come earlier. They come earlier. And, hang out. and you can think how they may have evolved with this is, you know, the, the rogue and a lot of these big mountain snowpack driven systems um, would have, you would have had that spring snow melt and that's where spring Chinook and summer steelhead they, they adapted to that, that opportunity that, hey, there's a lot of water moving in here and I can start migrating up and reach the highest points in the watershed. And then summertime comes and flows drop down, the snow starts melting away and you start having your more summer doldrums and low flows in the rivers. But they have made it up into these areas where now there's, you know, they're usually higher in a watershed, it's colder water and they can survive in the summer. And so the cool thing with that is then, as soon as those rains start coming, they're like the first ones there. They've adapted to be the first ones there to spawn. And Even when you before got that, the fall ones, because yep. they're already ready and they're yep. ready to go. Yeah. And when you got that happen many, many generations, we have a process called natural selection. And that's how you start having distinction between a, a summer steelhead or a winter steelhead. Um, they have special streams where they, they spawn. And so our summer fish, our summer steelhead, 
you know, they're anatomists just like our salmon. They'll wait and hang out. And then a lot of the streams in the Rogue Valley are actually dry right now. They hardly have any water in them. As soon as um, they get wetted up in the, in the winter or in the, yeah, the winter time, um, you know, by typically December into January, those creeks are, those smaller creeks are now flowing good enough that summer steel kid can now make it up in there and they'll spawn. Well, they get up there and spawn and then pretty soon you start having springtime and that creek starts slowly draining or st slowly drying up and at that point it's not a stream really for for a winter steel to go spawn in so so winter steel it'll spawn more in larger tributaries so that's um, why they have separate so they really have separate they kind of have this yeah this separate distinction completely separate or there's some it's overlap? not completely no it's a cool thing with nature that's is it's nature. not it's not completely separate yeah. and we don't have complete separation between spring chinook and fall chinook either there is definitely you know there's a there's a kind of a run peak of when these fish so a run is just uh when the big group of fish start migrating they have that big pulse and then it kind of levels out and then you'll see another pulse um usually fish are, are are migrating when there's like a rain event or something saying hey i can get farther upstream um but yeah you'll have on those margins kind of that's where you will have you know they're, they're in this they're the same species a fall chinook and a spring chinook are a chinook salmon and so if they mate and they they make babies they are essentially um you still have a Chinook salmon, but you might be changing, say, the run timing of, of those of so those species. Maybe doesn't know when to run. Well, maybe not know when to <laughs> run, but you might be like, rather than distinct runs, you might start mm -hmm. having just kind of like mm -hmm. a. It's gonna be in between yep. or kind of. And that's and that's kind of where it comes down so to man cool. managing species and, and trying to manage fisheries. Yeah. Um, I don't want to get too complicated into it with, and I wouldn't do this probably with with the, uh, the young audiences, but. Um, Essentially, you know, you, we, we as, as, as fisheries managers, we want to try and keep keep these distinct run timings um, as best as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, we have an altered system. You know, the Rogue has a dam on it and we've got about 30 miles of, of habitat for spring Chinook now and over 300 miles of fall Chinook habitat. And so spring Chinook have been impacted from the, the construction of Lost Creek Dam because spring Chinook would have swam well past that and hung out in that cold snow melt water and natural springs throughout the summer and then they would have been up there spawning and, and very distinct and separate from fall chinook you know a lot of times we we consider big butte creek as the only tributary that has a self-sustaining population of spring chinook um there is some the habitat requirements like good summer flows are present on little butte creek um little butte creek partly because it receives some irrigation conveyance, but it also is confined to a very narrow channel of Highway 144, so that's the North Fork. We do think that you could have spring chinook possibly over summering and hanging out up there. Um, but uh, you know, the, the neat thing about that is um, we are monitoring this situation. Um, there's been a, a lot of barriers and small dams that have been removed or improved upon in the last few years um, in Little Butte Creek specifically. And so that what that does allow is, is that fish are coming in earlier in the season. They could actually maybe migrate past these once barriers um, throughout pretty much the, the spring, summer and, and early fall. So, you know, lower Big Butte Creek gets a little warm in the summertime. But, um, you know, you the passage is there now that we could potentially see spring Chinook coming from the main Sum Rogue and going up in there. And, and ODFW, uh, myself, have been walking surveys on there seeing for looking for september spawners which would indicate a, a spring chinook salmon um, we found uh we have found one september spawner about two years ago um, one red that was completed in september so that kind of neat but that could be a, a you know an early fall fish or late spring salmon so but yeah there's um all these different creeks and sizes have you know there's different different fish that have essentially adapted and take more advantage of those streams um, salmon are usually more main stem spawners or large tributaries like bear creek steelhead are going to be more like lazy creek behind us and, and larson creek in, in medford so um a really cool little thing so you know salmon they don't hang out for a year or they hang out um, less than a year in fresh water 
And so these little fry are gonna be coming out and they're swimming out in their, in their natal tributary. <clears throat> They'll start their out migration down towards the ocean and the estuary um, when they're seven, seven months old, eight months old. They're usually hitting the ocean pretty much this time of the year, um, starting in the fall. Um, that ocean it, or that transition period, remember we have anadromous fish. And so, you know, salmon's physiology, how their body makeup is, all that stuff will change um, so that they can actually start handling salt water. And that transition period, it's like you guys going from elementary school to middle school, that middle school section, that's kind of the, in the salmon world, that's the estuary. The estuary is down in Gold Beach. The Rogue is a really interesting spot because normally we would think estuaries have a huge, huge role in the transition period. And, and, it, and it is a transition period in the Rogue, but you know, our neighbors to the north of us in Coos Bay have like 30, 40 miles of estuary habitat or ocean impact or ocean influenced habitat. The Rogue has like three miles. And so our fish are definitely just a little bit different. Um, even the Klamath River to the south of us has a little bit bigger estuary than the Rogue, but not much. I mean, it's a, it's a relatively small estuary. We think of a big estuary, think of San Francisco Bay. Think of, you know, the Columbia, think of Coos Bay, these big areas that are, that have tidal influence. And so you'll have that mixing of freshwater and saltwater. That's a really good thing. It's a great place. A little baby fish will dip their toes in or dip, you know, they'll go into the salt water and come back into fresh water and they'll be making this transition. A lot of good food in those regions also. How big are, are these these fish when they get to that estuary? When they get to the estuary, a baby, a baby salmon, about five inches. Um, a, a baby steelhead, a little bit different. A, a, a baby steelhead will hang out in fresh water for two years. Um, at least two years. We have some some uh, some juvenile steelhead that'll be a three year old or a four year old before they go to the ocean. And so there's a there's a life stage for that. It's called a smolt. S M O L T is smolt. And so really all that is is smolting is making that transition. Your body's changing. It can start handling salt water from fresh water, and then you make that transition out to the ocean. When you're in the ocean. It could be, uh, you know, on average, most of rogue, rogue Chinook salmon come back as four-year-olds. Um, historically, I mean, we had fish in like Alaska that would come back as seven-year-olds, six, seven-year-olds. Most of the time, you're not gonna see that. I mean, that's an 80 pound, 100 pound Chinook salmon. The average Chinook salmon for the Rogue River is about 25 pounds, 30 pounds. Um, that's usually gonna be a four-year-old fish or a five-year-old fish. So they hung out in the ocean for three, four years at least. Some of them might hang out there for five years and come back as a five-year-old. And then they they bring all that energy and all that nutrients that they got out in the ocean, bring it back to fresh water. And that's kind of the, the life cycle essentially starts again or ends again is how you want to look at it. So. Do they need to hang out in the estuary and come back? Like so they come back they hang out there to get Yep, there. yep. So yeah, so as you're coming back as an adult, um, they will hang out in the estuary a little bit. Um, there's a lot of theories, you know, fishermen will see, see salmon out there rolling. They'll kind of porpoise or come out. Some theories that that is kind of their transition as they're getting to fresh water. Some folks have, have, you know, hypothesized or thought of that maybe, you know, fresh water is usually on the top surface and, and salt water is usually more of a wedge like in the estuary. And you'll have higher concentrations of, of the minerals wherever their like natal stream was that's on the surface. So maybe they're getting a better sniff of it. I don't know. <laughs> These are all just kind of hypotheses. We're not fish, and, um, but we do do experiments. And that's kind of when I was saying earlier that we have that, there is evidence that Chinook have, or the salmon have a magnetic compass in them. Sharks have this as well. They can pick up the magnetic field of the earth and, and see, and it's like a map for them or their internal GPS that they know where they're at um, in relationship to the, the latitude of the earth. So and are they, they're not just sensing the North Pole, they're also sensing the magnetism in the rocks below them, Yes. Right? So yeah. They're getting specific. They're not just saying, well, that's North. They're saying this is such and such place. Somewhat. To an extent, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so like you'll see this with sharks. 
um, they can pick up, uh, there'll be seamounts and like ridges of like fresher earth crust that's in the ocean that when it comes out of the earth, whatever the, you know, magnetic gradient um, or strength of the North Pole draw was at that point, essentially gets frozen in time and it's in that crust. And then as that new crust moves, it moves it throughout the ocean. Yeah. And you'll see like seamounts and and ridges in the ocean. Hawaii is a great example of that. Um, but they'll have a signature of magnetic. There'll be a signature of that, yep. Yeah. And that's kind of like lines or roadmaps throughout the, throughout the, the, um, the continental shelf. Imprinting or homing, picking up the, the minerals of, of your natal stream, that can start as early as the um, egg stage. So essentially, minerals, not just that's what the smell it, that's is. The, the smell is mineral, it's dissolved mineral. minerals and chemicals in the ocean or in the in the in the water. Yep. So you're picking that up. So what, what triggers them when they're out in the ocean? What triggers them to come back? Like, I think it's so changing of the seasons. I mean, it's. I mean, we have. There's a lot of a lot of things like can transition a smolt can be the change of the uh, the photo period so longer days, water temperatures can start increasing that might trigger smolting. Um, from an adult standpoint, we do know that uh, we do know that run timing, so like spring run and fall run, is actually controlled by a, a gene and a variation on a gene that's heritable. That's what natural selection is: is you make babies and if you're really good at it your babies might live long, live a better life and make more babies in the future, survive greater. Um, so that runtime actually is heritable. Um, the age composition though, um, that also is, that's usually based on specific. Um, you know, the rogue, we, we look at scales and when we dissect a fish, which we're probably time to do, right? Yeah. Talking a lot. Um, the, the scales you can see how old a fish is actually by looking at their scales which is really cool and so like if you're a, if you know a forester or how they age trees um <clears throat> trees will have rings on them and you can see how how fast the tree was growing you can do the same thing with salmon scales and see how fast the salmon was growing in the ocean um the last few years we've had uh, some pretty poor ocean conditions so poor food sources and availability for them there's been a, a giant blob essentially of warm water off the Pacific coast. Um, that has, that's, that's a home for different species, more warm water species, not necessarily cold water loving species that benefit from like upwelling that salmon and steelhead need. Um, tuna, Dorado, these are like Mexico fish. Every year we have Dora, uh, tuna being caught off the Oregon coast, usually in October or, or uh, usually in September actually. Um, sometimes if you're lucky, you know, in, in August, um, but more recently. two years ago, well, two years ago, we had Dorado, um, two, 2019 was the highest albacore tuna landing in Oregon on the Oregon ports. And, um, we actually had like Dorado and, and these big, huge, um, I think they're called mola molas, like sunfish being spotted off the Oregon coast. And so that's, that's interesting, certainly. And there's this other, uh, thing called pyrosomes, which are like these, um, like Borgs, if you're a Star Trek fan, Borgs of the sea that kind of float around and they're normally found more in tropical and subtropical waters being found off here. So, but we are, we are lucky. Um, we do get a huge influence. Um, you know, if you go to the ocean in the summertime, you want to see it blowing northwesterlies like 20, 30 miles an hour at least. If it's kind of uncomfortable for you, it's probably really good for baby steelhead and baby salmon that are hanging out in the ocean, they're kind of in that upwelling um, zone. And so upwelling, essentially, it's northwesterly winds blowing off the surface waters. It kind of blows it more out to sea. And then the cold water that's down and in the bottom of the ocean up. comes up and replaces that warm water. When it comes with that, it's got all these awesome nutrients and those nutrients hit the surface. Suddenly that's food for phytoplankton. I didn't know it Phytoplankton. On wind. Yeah, that's hugely, just... hugely. And then the phytoplankton is the basis of the food chain for all the little critters, the, mm -hmm. the plankton, zooplankton that are out in the ocean. And so, you know, when, when that is really firing, that's a lot of good, good food for baby salmon. And that's what we refer to when we're talking about ocean conditions. It might be really good, like, you know, 10, 15 miles off the coast, um, but then you might get 20, 30 miles out there and then suddenly you have that warm blob. And that's what we've had um, 
probably in the last, since 2014, we really had that. There is some really good hope right now that are some uh, good signs that you know, we are seeing that ocean transition more to a, a cold, cold or productive ocean. Um, there still is some warm water out there. Could that cool our summers down here? Well, we're expecting a La Nina this coming year. So La Nina is usually colder water that's moved, that's, that's moved that tropical water further yeah. south of us. So, La Nina, usually pretty good, can be good for rogue salmon. Um, El Nino is not so much. So, yeah, I'm not an oceanographer, <laughs> but I play one on in my job sometimes. <laughs> I have to know a little bit of it all. So, yeah, but so let's go dissect a salmon yeah. or a steelhead, actually. <laughs>